So this talk I have entitled Corpora Literal and Metaphorical, and I am going to talk about bone rooms, both as a concept and this book, which is entitled Bone Rooms, as well as the relationship to AI ethics and some of the things that we're doing there. My next slide is entirely content warnings, but before we move on to the content warnings slide, I do want to just make explicitly clear that while this talk is full of criticisms that, of things that we are doing as an AI community, they are not criticisms of any particular individual. They are problems with the complex social systems that we live in and that we can all help to change, but there's not like one person putting a bunch of racism in AI single-handedly. With that said, this talk is going to deal with themes of racism and scientific racism, mistreatment of remains, and medical abuse. There will not be visual depictions of any remains, but the slide after this is an outline slide, and I'll pause briefly again after that in case you'd like to step away. There is a door in the back. I will not be even a little bit offended. You can leave and come back. I will be available later if you need to step away, but you still want to hear some of the stuff that came afterwards, but like, you can't hear it all in a row. Um, this is a heavy one. First, I'm going to talk about Bone Rooms, the book, as well as Bone Rooms, the concept. I'm going to talk a little bit about connections to AI. I'm going to talk a little bit about the concepts of decontextualization and collection, about how we got to this point, and about what we can do now. Here is the pause that I promised you all. If there is someone who does not want to hear this right now, then we can come get you outside, or I confirmed that there is a break right after this talk as well. So. This is the last talk before the break. First, I'm going to talk a little bit about bone rooms. There aren't a ton of direct quotes from the book here, and this isn't a book report or a summary, but this book, Bone Rooms, From Scientific Racism to Human Prehistory in Museums by Samuel J. Redman, heavily influenced my perspective on some of the problems that I had been working through as an AI practitioner who was reading a ton of ethical papers, like minimum one a week, 20 plus page papers at the time when I started to read this book. And it still really heavily influences my frame when I'm thinking through approaches to developing helpful AI tools with minimally harmful side effects. Here we have our first quote from the book. The slide says, scientists eager for evidence to support their ideas organized spaces colloquially known as bone rooms. In these spaces, they studied the bones in an effort to classify the races and understand, develop an understanding of the deeper human past. The bones that are in question here were often stolen or purchased bones, as well as other remains from people who did not consent to being included in these collections. Around the turn of the 20th century in the late 1800s and early 1900s, clashes between white settler colonists and Native Americans were very common and very fierce on the Native territories that are today most of the Midwestern US especially. And this violence became integrally connected with US and European scientists' pursuit of scientific racism. The pursuit of a scientific theory to explain or justify racial differences in a way that allowed them to justify white supremacist violence. But I also said that we're going to talk a little bit about AI today. First, I'm going to talk a little bit about the etymology of corpus and kind of the different senses in which the word corpus is used. Because corpus is a word that turns up a lot in the context of AI and that we talk about regularly. But additionally, corpus refers to the physical body of a person as well as a body of work like we use in artificial intelligence. A couple of the definitions here that I would especially like to highlight are one, the body of a human or animal, especially when dead, as well as 2B, the main body or corporeal substance of a thing, and also 3A and B. 3A is all the writings or works of a particular kind or on a particular subject, and 3B is a collection or body of knowledge or evidence. Today, we're going to talk about both of these types of corpus in relationship to each other. We are going to talk about physical bodies in that sense one, the body of a human or animal, especially when dead. And we're also going to talk about bodies of AI training data from sense 3B, a collection or body of knowledge or evidence, that information that is fed into a system and on which that system is built so that we are able to have nice AI tools that hopefully do good things to help us solve problems and achieve our creative goals.
But in both of these contexts, we're talking about this material being viewed as learning material, which is much less problematic when we're talking about words than about people's physical bodies. But I will argue still problematic even at, based on the ways that the corpora used to train AI systems are being developed. These are also both deeply personal to the owners and their families of the material that becomes a part of this corpus. Also, they're both a snapshot that can be used to represent or misrepresent a community, a group of communities, or an entire species. But to talk about the ways that it's misrepresenting, we're going to talk a little bit about decontextualization and collection. Here I have a definition of decontextualization in case people are not familiar with the term. They defined it as the process of examining or interpreting something that is separate from the context in which it is embedded, or I'm going to say was originally embedded for the purposes of this talk. This is from the Psychology Dictionary Professional Reference, which is an online dictionary. Decontextualization is a key to the dehumanization of colonialism. I'm gonna ask everybody to think about a time that you've had to explain a complex technical concept or a concept from your field to somebody who didn't really have a technical background. I know everybody in this room has done it at least once. Maybe it was a relative, a friend, a neighbor, somebody on a bus, a person who just overshared you in an airport bathroom. There is somebody you've gotten stuck explaining something to who had no frame of reference from which to start. It's an extremely different conversation than you would have about that topic with somebody who had a shared context with you. And it was probably a little frustrating for the people on both sides of that exchange. It was hard for you to calibrate what they would or wouldn't know about the topic, and they probably had periods of both feeling talked down to and being unable to follow what was going on because it was at too advanced of a level. This happens with cultures too, and part of the process of minoritization of cultures is when one group gets to set their context as the default context, where they don't give that extra information and you just have to follow along. You're either with them or you're not while all of the other groups, cultures, languages, traditions, and in this case, burial and social practices end up devoid of the context that gives them meaning for the participants. The power to be the default context is a core part of colonization and also was a core part of how the inclusion of many of these remains in bone rooms was justified. Because these bodies existed outside that default context of a certain expected set of burial practices, there were a number of assumptions made that the cultures that exhibited different burial practices just didn't care about these bodies or remains or that they wouldn't mind if this was being used for some greater scientific purpose like doing more racism. Decontextualization also occurs in collection. This is a really interesting photo because part of the photo description in the Creative Commons photo library I often use said that this was intentionally an assortment of random objects that they found around their office that had been grouped together for no particular reason as this collection and then presented as a group. Um, in the process of collection, you group maybe similar but often unlike objects or concepts together and you set a default frame, but to some degree, viewers are going to control and interpret that frame. The collection of cultural artifacts inherently decontextualizes them by grouping those objects or concepts together and requiring that a default frame be set. Contextualizing objects appropriately is a core goal of modern anthropology, and a lot of people are working very hard to improve this in contemporary museums, often to great effect. However, there will always be some nuance lost when an object is included in a collection or a corpus, and the viewers will to some degree apply their own nuance to the objects or the concepts that they witness. And by virtue of becoming, or by virtue of being more attuned to dominant cultural perspectives, they will by default often apply the dominant culture's frame, even if there isn't malice intended and it's really not an appropriate frame to be applying for that context. This is something I'm going to come back to again later because I think it's really important here. You don't have to be a bad person or trying to cause harm in order to see collections of information or materials through that default lens, and you do have to put in a great deal of effort if you're going to avoid that. So how did we get here? <laughs> 
Why were people collecting human remains? And why are we now collecting human cultures? This quote begins, I, I only have part of it on the slide, but this quote begins, while not all scientists were as bold and direct in their racist conclusions, collecting, studying, and displaying non-white human remains largely supported the scientific and pseudoscientific racism that dominated the era. In many respects, the practice reinforced existing and emerging colonial power dynamics veiled as scientific and social progress. In collections in bone rooms, there were occasionally some remains collected from white people, especially white people from other countries, where they were possibly able to sidestep local laws and regulations in order to get these as part of the collection to have a complete set. But the vast majority of these remains were of black and indigenous people of color. And a number of remains in particular were collected from South American countries, in some cases with the government's participation, but more often without the government's knowledge, and then smuggled to the US, which was the primary location of these bone rooms and the museums that promoted this type of study. Well, this kind of grab what you can approach that was used to compile initial collections of bones for bone rooms was also initially how we began to develop the large language learning models that we now use in AI in the hopes that things like safety or debiasing the training data would be able to come later. Um, further research, including the excellent stochastic parrots paper by Emily Bender, Timnit Gebru, Angelina McMillan Major, and an author we can safely assume was Margaret Mitchell publishing as Schmargaret Schmitchell, has shown that we cannot simply add safety as an extra layer after we've already approached collection without context. Image generators are somewhat newer, and so they're a little bit behind in this in terms of figuring out the actual impact of that initial decontextualized collection. But I suspect that once again, just as at least one of the models has released an open source version that people can use locally to generate non-worksafe content, we will discover that the biases and everything else that were in the original training set are in fact amplified in those generated images. And you can maybe reduce the prevalence of some of it, but it's going to be a huge, huge effort after the fact. I've included some examples of types of collections that we're using now in AI. At the top, we have a couple examples of training data, including the pile, which is exactly as it sounds, a big pile of a whole bunch of different sets of online content. We have wiki text, which is text from Wikipedia, as well as various versions of what's called a standardized Project Gutenberg corpus database, which takes literature from the Project Gutenberg open source project. We also have sets of benchmarks like glue and super glue that can be used for helping to measure the bias in a certain model along different axes. And different benchmarks are available to measure all sorts of things. They're not all bias focused, but these are some that I'm more familiar with from that angle. There are also collections of that form the actual models and pre-training approaches. BERT and Roberta are two that are particularly well known and that are commonly used for research because they're easily accessible. But if you want to view a whole bunch of different collections and the ways that they are being used in AI, I really like the Hugging Face search engine, which will actually let you filter for which type of collection you want to look for. It'll let you see papers that used that thing and you can kind of follow the impact of that particular collection on all of the, um, re really on the AI industry in general. So what now? This has been a very heavy talk so far, and I appreciate you all bearing with it. But let's think a little bit more about the current state of AI corpus development and how we should decide when and how to use AI-powered tools in our workflows. How could this be different? We don't have to and should not just accept the amplification of racism and other biases in our policies and processes, but neither should we throw out AI options altogether. I think that there's still hope, but we're going to have to look at the problem straight on and do real work towards handling these problems. One of the core things that we need to do is work on building corpora respectfully. 
the image on this slide shows a group of people who are standing around outside of a door on a brick building, and in front there is a sign reading community cafe that is pointing in their direction. The disability rights community popularized in English the phrase, nothing about us without us, to mean that people most affected by decisions and policies should get to have a say in how those decisions are made and those policies are developed. If you're in a position to set AI policy or to build corpora of any sort, pay special attention to the opinions and objections of those on your team who are likely to be most affected if something goes wrong. If those people aren't represented on your team, consider that you might not be the right team to build that thing, at least right now. I think it's also important that we try our best to avoid decontextualization. Unlike the previous image where a bunch of random items were shown together, here we see a CD collection. And so these are all CDs owned by a specific person. It is a thematically developed corpus, unlike the previous one. As you involve your community more, you can also reduce the decontextualization inherent to your corpus. Consider the specific purpose of any AI tool that you're building or considering using, as well as whether that tool is appropriate or was expected to be appropriate for your intended use case. Generalized artificial intelligence sounds very flashy, but without guardrails around the types of tasks and better vetting practices in at the level of corpus development than we currently have, your tool will reproduce and magnify social biases in ways that you don't want. But how can you avoid these patterns? Unfortunately, there is no easy answer. The best that you can do is practice. You're going to mess up, and you'll need to work very hard to make it right. In some cases, you may not be able to make those mistakes right, and all you can do is try to do better and not repeat those mistakes moving forward. By involving relevant stakeholders, considering the historical implications of your processes and how that may affect their future impact on others, and being careful, even when you're excited, you can avoid the worst mistakes and continually improve as you try to grow with your community. Oh no. <laughs> well, there was going to be a photo on here of a pretty typical looking house in downtown Philadelphia that some of you might have recognized. Um, some of you probably would have recognized this house, either by sight or by the image citation that was just below it on the slide that is not loading. And if you did, you probably would have known where I was going with this already. This fairly normal, though somewhat fortified house was the home of members of the Black Liberation Group MOVE, which the Philadelphia police bombed with members of all ages inside about a month after this photo that I'll post to Twitter so you can all still see it was taken in 19, 1985. This photo was from April of 1985 and the bombing was in May. The remains of Delisha and Tree Africa, who were killed in that attack when Delisha was only 13 years old and Tree was 14, were finally released to their surviving brother about two months ago, on August 3rd, 2022. After years of pressure that mounted and increased, especially over the last year, the remains were clearly mishandled, including being stored in cardboard boxes in a professor's office and in a professor's home and they were used for research and teaching without the consent of their surviving relatives, including in a Coursera course, a very modern thing that lots of us probably don't associate with the history of bone collection and display. This was the latest stage of what even the University of Pennsylvania, one of two universities implicated in the desecration of these little girls alongside Princeton, admitted is a legacy of the mishandling, disrespect for, and mistreatment of the bodies of people of color in the United States especially black and indigenous bodies. This isn't a talk with a happy wrap up about how we've solved this problem before and we can do it again, because we haven't even solved the first form of this yet. We can, however, avoid perpetuating new forms of the same terrible patterns and remain cognizant of the history behind our work from both within our field and from overlapping fields that have faced similar issues in the past. Thank you.